Well, this is it, the last weekend of 2019. Has it gone by fast? You know, it didn't for me. <laughs> I, I don't remember a year that was slower. It was tough and challenging. We faced a lot individually as a team, as a church, but we're still standing. And really, the 40 days of prayer and fasting wrote a new ending to the year. Thank you for praying with me for breakthroughs. And I've got a great testimony because two days ago, my grandson, Maverick, was born. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm believing 2020 will be a year of breakthroughs, that God's going to do great transformative things in your life. That doesn't mean you won't face difficulty. You still live in this world where you're guaranteed to face problems and challenges. But the God you serve is bigger and greater than anything that comes against you. Uh, 2020 promises to be a divisive, divided year in our country. The run-up to the elections will no doubt be filled with hate, anger, accusations, and arguments. People will be tense and on edge. You're going to be sick of seeing political ads and reading ridiculous rants online. You might already be sick of it. And that's going to present us some challenges at church and a wonderful opportunity. I'm going to do a lot of coaching so we represent Jesus well. People watching should see us love each other and love them in spite of our political differences. I'll preach on it in a few weeks, but we're going to remember that every Republican matters to God, every Democrat matters to God, and every confused, angry, undecided voter matters to God. His kingdom will not come to an end regardless of who's voted into office. You know, we used to say, act like an adult. That's no longer good advice. I don't want you to act like adults. <laughs> Instead, the goal is, let's act like Jesus. Amen. This passage from Philippians chapter 2, let this frame your approach. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others, that's even people who don't agree with you, better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, here's the standard. This is challenging. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of his obedience, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That passage should be our goal and approach for 2020. Be loving, be unified, be unselfish, put others first, and have the same attitude as Jesus, a humble, obedient servant. And if we do that, then God will use us, and God will exalt Jesus through us. So when you want me to join divisive political arguments, I'm going to remind you of that verse and the example of Jesus. Let's be that. Make it your goal to love people and be united with God's church, regardless of politics, race, color, or immigration status. And don't forget, we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. Okay, you're probably going to hear that more than once. But today I want to focus on three things. I want to focus on three facts that will absolutely change your outlook on 2020 and your life. Now, before I get to those, let's talk about the typical way people approach a new year with plans and goals uh, called resolutions. I used to make a big, long list of resolutions, uh, but the problem was I couldn't remember them all. And so I had no hope of keeping them. So now I pick one big thing. One thing I sense the Lord would have me change 
And then I focus on that one thing all year long. And I have a rule. I don't share my one big thing with anyone else. I want to see if people notice the difference in me. I've been thinking and praying about my one big thing for 2020. But in the next few days, millions of Americans will sit down, think back over the past year, and make New Year's resolutions. According to the Statistic Brain Research Institute, here are the top 11 resolutions. Number one, lose weight or eat healthier. Number two, life or self-improvements. Pretty broad category. Number three, make better financial decisions. Number four, quit smoking. Number five, do more exciting things. It's a pretty broad resolution again. Number six, spend more time with family and close friends. Number seven, work out more often. Number eight, learn something new on my own. Number nine, do more good deeds for others. Number 10, find the love of my life. And judging by social media the last few days and all the engagements at Christmas time, some of you, you've already accomplished that. And now your goal is just to still love each other while you plan a wedding. <laughs> and then coming in at number 11, find a better job. 41% of Americans make resolutions. Of that 41%, only 9.2% feel they successfully have kept a resolution in the past. So 9.2% of 41%. That means only 4.5% of Americans will make a resolution and actually keep it. For just over 42% of Americans say they never succeed and they failed at their New Year's resolutions every year. But for some reason, they just keep making them. Many make the same resolution over and over. So... Do those numbers mean you shouldn't set goals? Absolutely not. You can be one of the 4.5% who determined to change and do it. Here's a couple of quick tips to help you. Number one, write it down. Be specific. Don't just say lose weight. Actually get on a scale. Weigh yourself. Write down where you are. Establish a goal weight. Don't just say work out more. Make a specific goal. How many times a week are you going to work out? Uh, don't just say learn Spanish. Be specific. What does that look like? What does that mean? Second, chart your progress. Keep a journal. That's the number one, number one habit of people who successfully make life changes. They write it down. They chronicle it. Number three, develop accountability. Empower someone in your life to challenge you and ask the tough questions. Number four, expect obstacles. It won't be easy. Expect difficulty so you won't be surprised when it happens. If you're making a significant life change, it's going to be challenging. And then number five, plan a big celebration. Reward yourself for reaching your goal. Now, if your goal is to lose weight when you reach your goal, don't eat an entire chocolate cake, but maybe just a, a ding dong or something like that. You can plan little celebrations along the way. When you reach a milestone, treat yourself. Okay, I'd love to see you reach your goals. But today I want to focus on three things. Three facts that will change your outlook on 2020 and can change your life. Regardless of your resolutions, these three thinking changes are absolutely key. I'm going to share the thought with you and then have a member of our team share their journey in that area. Here's the first one. You ready? There's nothing in the past that God can't redeem. You are new in Christ. And I've asked our recovery pastor, Pastor Lane Mason, to come and to share his story of God's redemptive power. Uh, for redeem is compensate for our faults or bad aspects of something. And the definition that best explains the kind of redemption that I'm going to talk about tonight is from Merriam-Webster, and it is to release from blame or debt, to clear the debt, to be free from consequences of sin. Now, I'll never forget the moment that I realized what I had become. My years of addiction had led me to a place of self-condemnation and despair. And over and over again, I failed to control my drinking. The results were sickening. I'd lost my ability to function in my job, I'd lost my home, my car. I damaged the most important relationships in my life. 
But this last episode was unforgivable. I'd done the unthinkable. Something I told myself that I would never, ever do. My actions, the use of violence against someone that I loved, resulted in my arrest. And it was quite apparent that I'd crossed a line that could end up costing me the most important person in my life, my wife. But God had another plan. If you've committed some horrible sins like I did, it can be hard to accept the statement that you are made new in Christ. You say things like, God could never forgive me for what I did. God wouldn't want to, want to redeem me after I've messed up so many times. What I did was so horrible, God couldn't and wouldn't redeem that. Listen, God can and he will redeem you from your past. One of the most powerful examples of this is Saul of Tarsus. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples and he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven appeared. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. On the road to Damascus, Saul had a powerful encounter with the Lord. He knew about Jesus' ministry. Everybody did. But up until that time, Saul didn't believe that Jesus was the Redeemer, the Savior promised by God. Saul was a persecutor of Christians, but that day on his way to capture Christians and take them pr to prison, Saul saw Jesus for who he really was. Now, keep in mind, this is the same man that brought so much persecution to the early church. And yes, he was a persecutor of Christians, yet he was redeemed by the love of Jesus. Saul was later known by the name of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He was responsible for spreading the gospel throughout the known world in his time, and he wrote much of the New Testament. Now, would God use someone as wicked as Saul to be an instrument to share his redeeming power? Yes, that's exactly what he did. And if he can do it for Saul or he can do it for me, he can do it for you. As I sat in that cell, pondering how wretched that I had become, I said a prayer to a God I didn't even believe in. I said, God, if you're actually there, I need you. And God the Father, who I had no relationship with, showed me mercy. He heard and he answered my prayer that day. And my life has never been the same. God forgave my sins, all of them, and he redeemed my life. And he has used a broken, unworthy sinner like me to reach other sinners who struggle with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Today, I'm a pastor. God forgave me for every sin I'd committed, and he redeemed my life. Now, if you're like me, it, uh, it did take a while to forgive myself, but with God's help, he did, and I did. And if you struggle to forgive yourself, I want to share the steps that I took that led to my forgiveness. First, confess your sins. Your sin, confess your sin to God and then to the person that you hurt. Admit that you were wrong and own it. Don't make excuses. Show remorse and say how sorry you are. 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Next, repent. Repenting is turning away from the sin and not repeating it. Acts 3.19 explains, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. You know, sometimes repenting includes getting some help. If an addiction or a compulsive behavior has caused you or others lots of harm, get some help. Celebrate Recovery meets here every Tuesday night at 645 here at First NLR. And I want you to know that CR is a no judgment zone. It's a place where you can find hope and healing.
in the arms of a loving Savior. Excuse me. You'll be encouraged. You'll be edified in the process when you come to CR. And we'll be meeting on Tuesday on New Year's Eve. So start it off the right way, sober. Third, accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for, for all of your sins, even the most despicable ones. His blood covers all sins. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And lastly, pray that you'll see yourself through God's eyes, forgiven and redeemed. Pray Bible verses that emphasize the fact that you are forgiven. This helps you put your mind on the truth rather than on the lie that you can't be forgiven. You know, one of my favorite verses for this is Isaiah 118. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your skin, sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Friends, because of Jesus' sacrifice... And the forgiveness offered to any and all who put their trust in him. There is absolutely nothing in the past that God can't redeem. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, Therefore, if anyone is new in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You have been redeemed. You are a new creation. I was hopeless, I knew I was lost, and death and darkness were my only soul. But your mercy did for me.
Would you bow your heads with me? And I want to pray for you. If there's something in your past that you're struggling to move beyond, and, and your prayer as we enter 2020 is, Lord, help me. Help me to become new and redeemed by you. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. But if that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. If you're watching online, hit the button or enter in the text box. Yeah, a whole lot of us. Lord, we leave the past in the past. Lord, we thank you that uh, it's not the process of turning the page on the calendar that makes the difference, but it's the process of your mercy and operation in our lives. And you have promised us that you came for every sin that we've committed. So Lord, I pray for people in this room, people watching online who, who have felt trapped by the mistakes and the failures and the sin of the past. I pray, God, that you would do a new thing in them in 2020. Lord, as they move forward, redeemed by you, they would be able to forgive themselves and they would never go back because you've got a new future and a new plan for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Gary, our student and deaf ministry pastor, is coming to share his family's journey with this next thought. There is nothing in the present God can't change. There's hope for you. 2019 started off great. In February of this year, my daughter, Sarah Eden, was born. I kind of like her. <laughs> Thankfully, her brother loves her, and she already has me wrapped around her little fingers. This year started exciting, promising. But everything changed a few months later. On Tuesday, May 14th, I was about to go to North Rocks High School graduation, and my wife texted me. She texted me to say that she wasn't feeling well, and then she called me and said, we need to go to the hospital. She was experiencing strange sensations in her feet. She was incredibly exhausted and in severe pain. Over the next 24 hours, her bladder stopped working. She had no strength and little control of her legs, and she developed severe involuntary leg movements that lasted for hours at a time. At the time, we didn't know it, but all this was happening because of pressure on her spine. As several doctors had come and consulted to determine what was going on in her body. The initial diagnosis was both severe and challenging. A spinal tap found a very high level of white blood cells and elevated protein levels in her spinal fluid, indicating an infection. An MRI revealed inflammation throughout her spine. After a few more tests, the neurologist came in with urgency in her voice and told us that Chelsea would receive 1,000 milligrams of steroids every day for the next seven days, and that if we didn't start immediately, there was a high probability that she would be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of her life. We were rocked. We had a four-year-old, a three-month-old, and we were facing a very real scenario where Chelsea would be completely paralyzed for the rest of her life. The statistics for the diagnosis are dismal at best. It's an incredibly rare infection. One study reported that there are only about 1,200 new cases a year. 33% make a full recovery. 33% make a partial recovery. 33% are paralyzed. It's pretty daunting percentages. We were overwhelmed. We were lost, hopeless. As a husband, I, I felt powerless. I felt desperate. My question is, have you ever been there? Desperate, powerless? Some of you are 
you're there right now. But I want to remind you that your situation that feels desperate, that feels powerless, didn't surprise God. Now, it may have caught you off guard. The Tuesday I took Chelsea to the ER, we had no idea the journey that was ahead. It took us completely by surprise. But it didn't surprise God. Listen to me. Look at me. He knows. He knows you. He knows what you're facing. He knows exactly what you're going through. When the doctors are puzzled, he's not. When the teachers don't have the answer, he does. When the counselors aren't sure which direction to go, he knows the way. We find so many stories through Scripture where men and women of faith, they, they just faced impossible odds. Joseph was almost killed by his brothers and sold as a slave. Job lost everything, his family, his health, his possessions. Moses faced uh, the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army closing fast. Daniel was thrown into a den of hungry lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were locked tight in a fiery furnace. Jesus faced death while hanging on a cross. If you find yourself in a place with no hope, if you feel trapped, if you are defeated and discouraged, if death is staring you in the face, if it looks like there's no way out, remember there is nothing in the present God can't change. There is hope for you. If someone in your family or if you are hopelessly addicted to alcohol, drugs, or pornography, there is hope for you. If your marriage is falling apart and it doesn't look like it's going to work, there is hope for you. If your bank account is at zero and you have no idea when your next check is coming, there is hope for you. The doctor's report, it doesn't look good. You're filled with fear and anxiety. There is hope for you. There is nothing in the present God can't change. You say, Gary, how can you say that? You don't know what I'm facing. You're right. I don't know the details of your situation, but God does. He knows. And from his word and my own life experience, I've seen this truth played out over and over again. Joseph, well, he went from being a slave to a king who saved a nation. Job was given back twice as much as he lost. God miraculously split the Red Sea, allowing Moses and the Israelites to escape. Daniel left the lion's den completely unharmed. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't alone in the fire. They had a divine protection and weren't even burned. Jesus defeated evil and death when he walked out of the tomb three days after dying on the cross. And Chelsea, after a month-long stay in the hospital and losing the functions in her legs, Chelsea walked out of the hospital. Listen to me. If the odds are stacked against you and it looks like it's impossible, remember there is nothing in the present God can't change. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah
Bow your heads with me. If you're facing a difficult challenge right now, you're in the middle of it, and you say, I need, I need what Pastor Gary just talked about, God to change my situation. I want you to raise your hand, we're going to pray for you. Take a look around. Somebody near you with their hand raised. Reach over. Put your hand on their shoulder. Put your arm around them or go to them. We're going to pray and believe right now because God can turn it around. In Jesus' name, Lord, we come to you today thankful that you are a God who is not intimidated by our circumstances and that even when we are, feel powerless, you are almighty. And so we stand in confidence today. God, I ask you to do miracles. I ask you to turn things around. Lord, I ask you to heal marriages that seem hopelessly broken, to heal bodies when doctors have no answer. Lord, I pray that you would do miracles financially and with jobs and in relationships because you are a miracle-working God, and we rejoice in the fact that there is nothing you can't change, nothing. And so we ask you for miracles, for the supernatural intervention of God in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, one more key thinking change. And I've asked Becca Winslow, my writing partner, to share this one. There's nothing in the future God can't take care of. You can trust him. One night, I was tucking my seven-year-old little boy, Nate, into bed, and I leaned down to kiss his forehead. And when I did, I felt something under his pillow. So I reached under, and I pulled out this tiny souvenir tomahawk. And I said, Nate, why is this under your pillow? And he explained to me, well, he was afraid that somebody was going to break into our house. And he was going to use this weapon to smack them silly. I explained to him that it wasn't his job to defend himself or to defend himself from intruders, that his dad and I were there to protect him. But no amount of convincing would get him to surrender the tomahawk. It went right back under his pillow where it started. You know, it's funny and cute when it's a seven-year-old little boy and a toy tomahawk. But what about you? What keeps you up at night? What worries and concerns are you holding on to? Maybe you've listened to Pastor Lane's and Pastor Gary's stories, and you're wondering, when is the other shoe going to drop for you? When is your luck going to run out? When is tragedy going to strike your family? We live in an anxious world. Research indicates that nearly 40 million people in the United States experience an anxiety disorder in any given year. That's one in five of us. Overwhelming concerns about financial security, job stability, health and relationships weigh you down and intrude on your thoughts. And anxiousness 
isn't limited to adults. Our students are experiencing rising levels of anxiety and depression. And according to the Pew Research Center, whether they personally suffer from these conditions or not, seven in 10 teens see them as major problems among their peers. So if students aren't worried about their own lives, they're worried about their friends' lives. Jesus knew you would face worry, stress, and anxiety. He told his disciples, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. For the pagans, or people who don't know God, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. In other words, it's reasonable for people who don't know God to be consumed with worry. They have no other option. But as followers of Jesus, worrying is a choice. You can opt out. You have a heavenly father who knows what you need and wants to give you good things. Jesus said in Matthew 7, which of you, if your son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You can opt out of worrying because your heavenly Father loves you and wants to take care of you. Jesus presented us an alternative to worry in Matthew 6. He said, instead of worrying about all that stuff that everyone else worries about, instead of chasing after all those things and wearing yourself out, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It is an incredible offer. When you trust the Lord to take care of you, when you stop flailing around trying to deal with your own concerns and instead focus on his concerns, you get to exchange your anxiety for his peace. When I came to work at First NLR, my husband and I had to take our daughter Layla out of a school she loved and enroll her in a new unfamiliar one. Now, years from now, this might not seem like a big deal, but right now, it's, it's probably the hardest thing I've done as a parent so far. Because I'd been a teacher in the district where she attended, I knew practically everyone. But now, I was sending her where I knew no one. I was worried about everything, the culture of the school, whether she'd make good friends, whether her teachers would like her. But we were convinced the Lord had opened a door for me to be here. And if this was God's plan for me, then it had to be his plan for our kids as well. I would love to tell you that everything was a breeze, that Layla immediately fell in love with her school. But that's not the case. It was a really tough adjustment. However, looking back now, I recognize lessons that each of us learned, ways we've grown as a family that I would never trade, not to mention all the rewards my kids experience as a result of being here so often. Layla now tells me, you're not allowed to get another job. (laughs) We are stronger as a family because we trusted God's plan even when we couldn't understand every last detail. If you are stressed because you can't see very far into the future, because you can't quite work out how everything's going to go, I have a word for you today. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. There is nothing in the future your God can't take care of. You can trust him. All that stuff you're tempted to worry about, work, money, kids, school, relationships, aging, loss, health, happiness, safety, all of that. You don't have to stress yourself out about it. You can trust the Lord instead. It's time to put down the tomahawk. 
that worry, that stress, that anxiety, you can put it down. You weren't meant to keep watch. That's your father's job. There is nothing in the future God can't take care of. You can trust him. Would you bow your heads with me? If you struggle with worry and anxiety and fear, if when we talk about the year ahead, that makes you nervous, I'm going to ask Becca to pray for you today. If that's you, and it's maybe even anxiety and fear, stress is a frame for your life, and you want to be free from that, we're just going to pray. Would you just raise your hand? She's going to lead us in praying for you. Come on, Becca, lead us. Lord, God, right now we just invite your peace. Lord, I pray that you would cover my friends with your peace. Yes, Lord. Jesus, I pray that you would just so very clearly put a light on each anxiety, each worry that they need to release to you. Jesus, I pray that you would show them how to do it, that you would empower them to do it. Lord, and as they, as they trust you, yes. as they lean not on their own understanding, God, that they would make that trade. Lord, yes. right now, we trade anxiety <laughs> for peace. We trade our anxiety for your peace. Yes. Jesus, I pray that my friends would walk out of here tonight knowing that they can trust you, that there is nothing in the future that surprises you. There is nothing, nothing in the future you can't take care of. We love you. We trust you. Amen. This, this song that Madison is going to sing is kind of the song I lean on and go to in times of anxiety and fear and worry. Would we'll you just keep your eyes closed and let Madison sing this and let this be your prayer as we conclude our final services of 2019. Let this be your prayer. May your struggles keep you near the cross And may your troubles show that you need God And may your battles end the way they should And may your bad days Prove that God is good and may your whole life prove that God is good and may your struggles keep you near the cross and may can ever imagine. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming to church. Have a happy new year. God bless you.